Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming uh, to another session of uh, Agent B Tech Webinars project. We just changed the format, and uh, now we are going to send you a recording once a, once a month. Uh, thank you very much, our sponsors. So if we start counting them, uh, MISTI, MIT Israel, if you are interested in exploring this opportunity to host MIT interns, please contact David David Olev at DD. Uh, OLEV at MIT.edu and then we have uh, YAC Young Adult Center if you want to arrange a meeting with an entrepreneurship coordinator or hear more about our activities at the Haifa Young Adult Center you're more than welcome to approach Naama Lul. Uh, we have also Beertech. Beertech uh, is a Haifa monthly meetup that combines both lectures from leaders of the technological entrepreneurship industry and, net, and the networking event. The event goes on every last Monday of the month. Birtek is sponsored by Qualcomm Israel. You, you're more than welcome to join the Facebook group and get updates. Uh, BIG is a group of Israeli and American Jewish young adults from Boston area who care big time about Israel. Our mission is to connect Israeli and American Jewish young adults while facilitating awareness of Israel in the greater of Boston area. You're more than well, welcome to contact Eliad, of course. Uh, Mobixon, uh, which we are making the, this recording from now, uh, is a leading software development company that specializes in the development of mobile applications. More than welcome to contact, of course. And, okay, so Markel is a principal in the Southern California office of Fisher, Fish and Richardson PC. His practice focuses on patent strategy and litigation across a variety of technological areas, and he and his family have been living in Israel this past year. Michael is also visiting fellow at AEI's Center for Internet Communication and Technology, Technology Policy. Michael is also an adjunct, which means he teaches a, in faculty as a professor of law at the University of San Diego School of Law. He is a regular uh, contributor to the American Politico and the Weekly Standard. His work also appears in Re uh, Reuters, Opinion, National Review Online, and uh, Commentary, as well as in a variety of San Diego's based newspapers and online outlets. Uh, you're more than welcome to check his bio as well, but uh, you can find him in Facebook or Twitter uh, or LinkedIn, of course. And now we are more than uh, uh, we are honored to to hear what you have to say, uh, what you have to teach us. So thank you very much, Michael. Please. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Rosen. As Oded said, I am a principal with the law firm of Fish and Richardson. We are the oldest and the largest, and in my opinion, the best intellectual property law firm in the world with uh, over 400 professionals across 11 offices in the United States and one office in Munich. And we are focused not entirely, but uh, almost entirely on intellectual property, strategy, litigation, patent prosecution, trademark work, copyright work, trade secret, um, and some other related fields. And I've been working at the firm for now uh, coming up on 11 years in our Southern California office. And as Oded said, since August, my family and I have been living in Israel, where I've been working partly for my US clients uh, and partly for Israeli clients and also taking a fair amount of time uh, to do business development and meet with new clients and potential clients. And I would be very happy to take time to get together with you if you have any IP related questions or issues that we may be able to help you with. Great. So let's start with our presentation, Michael. Ah, so no questions? You want to ask? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, we start in the afterwards. Okay, whatever you want. I said that once in. I mean, no, it's badly. Okay. Okay. Achshav, so now I want us to share the. Screen or it's or I just go to here and it'll be shared automatically. Uh, yeah. Okay. I got no. Sorry.
Okay. Okay. Okay, Michael. Okay. Sorry? Please. Let's uh, start with the presentation. We, we break your. We have a special. Every question. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We said that. So today we're going to talk about the issue of the patentability of software, which means in what situations can someone who's developing a software product receive a patent, and in what situations can they not receive a patent? And when thinking about patents, the idea, at least in the United States, and, and this is what we're going to be focusing on, is when you come up with an invention, the invention has to be new, meaning no one can have come up with it before you. It has to be non-obvious, which means that before you did, if it's so obvious an invention, you can't get a patent for it. And then there's a third category, that is decided by the statutes in the U.S. And that is what even, before we even get into what's new and non-obvious, what kind of thing is even eligible to become patented? And what do I mean by that? We're gonna explore this. But if you think about the basic idea, if you do something, you discover a law of nature or a new mathematical theory, you can't get a patent on that you have to actually come up with an application of an idea in order to get a patent on it. And if that sounds confusing to you, good, we're on the right track because it is confusing. And even to the pre-dates and to people like me who practice this all their lives and all their careers, this is a very confusing distinction. And since a recent case came out called the Alice case that we're gonna talk about last summer, this entire issue of what is it that's eligible to get a patent, this has become very, very difficult and challenging for lawyers, for software developers, and for all sorts of people in the IP world. So that's what we're going to try to deal with today. Um, on the agenda, we're going to talk about the Alice case itself, and I'm moving now to slide number two. We're going to talk about the Patent Office. The USPTO is the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This is the office that is in charge of receiving applications for patents and trademarks as well, but we'll, we'll put trademarks to the side for today, and to considering those applications and to deciding what types of inventions are worthy of receiving a patent and which types are not. So the Patent Office itself has issued guidelines based on the Supreme Court's case to help people understand what will and will not receive a patent. And then we're gonna take in, in, in bullet number three here, we're gonna take a look at some specific examples of what is and is not eligible for a patent. I always find, at least um, in, in my own experience, that it's difficult sometimes to talk about these very abstract ideas but when we see some actual examples of what did the court say you can get a patent on and what did they say you can't, it helps us understand that. And then the last point is what do we do now? I think this is maybe the most important piece of advice um, for those of you listening who are involved with software companies or, or in related fields. We're gonna talk about how do we deal with this situation? What are some overarching strategies? And it's gonna be difficult in the 45 minutes we have to get into real specifics but at least I'll give you some general guidance that hopefully you'll find interesting and helpful. And as I mentioned at the outset, very happy to get together and talk with you about your very specific um, situations. So what happened in the Alice case? And just as by way of background, just so you understand the general process for receiving a patent and enforcing a patent in the US, a company or an inventor will apply to the patent office for a patent. The patent office will go back and forth with the applicant over different issues, what is and isn't eligible for a patent, what is and isn't new about your patent. And eventually, after as long as it could be several years, you receive a patent. And, and what the right to do is to prevent other people from using the invention that you claim in your patent. Well, it does. It doesn't give you the right to make anything. It doesn't oblige you. It doesn't obligate you to have to make that patent. 
but it does give you the power and the right to prevent other people from using your patent. And what that means is that you can go out then and license your patent to others. You can sue other parties in court who are using your patent without your permission. You can try to stop them from using it by getting what's called an injunction, or you can try to sue them for damages, for damages that you suffered because they're able to sell this product with your ideas and you're not, or simply because they're using your technology. So what happened in the Alice case is a company, a small company called, uh, was involved with a bank called CLS Bank. And the question was over a patent that Alice had, that Alice believed CLS Bank was using without its permission. That's called infringement, patent someone's ideas or patent claims without their permission. And what this patent involved in particular was a computer implemented scheme for mitigating third party settlement risk via a third party intermediary. All right. So what does this mean? Um, we're going to see exactly what this is in a moment when we uh, when we turn the, the page. But the idea here was essentially, if you imagine two uh, two companies, one company wants to buy a certain asset from another company and the other company wants to sell that asset to that company. So we'll call it company B and company S, the buyer and the seller. Company B wants to make sure that company S, the seller, actually has the asset in its possession. And company S wants to make sure that company B, the buyer, has sufficient money to pay for the asset. And of course, they're going to tell each other that they have that, that, that money or that asset, but they may not necessarily trust each other. So what the Alice uh, patent came up with was a way for both of these parties to use a third party intermediary to help determine and ensure that each party had what it claimed it had. And this intermediary was done, this, this system was affected via a computer. And a computer essentially acted like an escrow agent. If you can imagine in a transaction, you have an escrow that's a trusted third party by both sides. It verifies that S, company S, has the asset, the company B has the money. If it fits, Wonderful, you make a shit off and, you, uh, and, and it comes together and you can, you can do the deal, all right? So the problem is that this idea is not necessarily something that is patent eligible. And the reason is, as I mentioned in this fourth bullet here, the courts found that this quote unquote invention was little more than the abstract idea of reducing settlement risk by affecting trades through a third party intermediary. This concept of using a third party to help make sure that a trade is, is real and legitimate, this is not something um, that, that is concrete enough that it deserves to have a patent. It's too abstract is what the court said, okay? And the Supreme Court then, these were what the lower court said. And this case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. It's not often that the Supreme Court handles a patent case. You can imagine in the US, there are thousands and thousands of cases that people want the Supreme Court to deal with, but there's just not enough time, there's not enough resources to handle all of them. So the Supreme Court issues opinions very rarely, but on this one, it issued a unanimous opinion. And this is what it said. It said there are two steps to trying to determine whether a patent claim is too abstract to deserve a patent. The first step is, and this is the first sub bullet here, and, and we're on slide number four. Do the claims involve an abstract idea, a natural phenomenon, a law of nature, or a product of nature? Okay, is there any element of these ideas in the claim itself? If so, then what else is there in the claims before us? This is the second part of the test. There has to be something significantly more, remember that phrase, significantly more than the abstract idea. If it's just the idea or even a little bit more than the idea, can't get a patent on it. If it's significantly more, you can get a patent. And in this particular case, they said, yes, in fact, this idea of hedging risk through an intermediary, it's an abstract idea. And the claims, which all that the claims did was put this into software, those claims, failed to transform that abstract idea 
into a patent eligible invention. In other words, there wasn't something significantly more in the claims in this Alice case. And this is what Justice Clarence Thomas of the Supreme Court, he's the one who wrote the opinion, this is what he said. Stating an abstract idea is not enough for patent eligibility. Stating an abstract idea while adding the words, apply it with a computer, simply combines with the same deficient result. So what does that mean? You can't just take an abstract idea and then say, a way to put it on a computer. That's not something that deserves a patent. And we're going to we're going to take a look at why that the logic is, but that's what happened in the Alice case. And this was at the time it didn't seem like it was all that groundbreaking, but we're going to see exactly what happened. And here on slide 6, I I've uh, taken the liberty of bar some pictures from Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland movie. Um, but what happened immediately after this Alice case started going a little bit crazy, and they still are. And we're going to see that. Michael, can, if I may ask you a small question. We are talking about a, a process, right? A process you transform to the computer, like shopping through a system. Uh, it can't, because it's a process already existing process, it's an abstract, it can't be turned into, into patent. Right. Right. So what makes it a little bit tricky is whether or not it already existed doesn't quite matter for this. Okay. In other words, you could come up with a brilliant new abstract idea that no one had ever even thought of before. But if it's just an abstract idea and you don't have a concrete way of putting it into practice, you can't get a patent on it. So it's a little bit confusing because most of the examples we're going to see are older abstract ideas, which is a problem from that perspective too. But it's not just that it's old, that it existed, it's that it's too abstract, it's too too much in the clouds. I guess the Hebrew word is sort of ruchani, or uh, or too too exactly, too too high up there. It's not grounded and, and put into a concrete form. And the reason, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just preview this and explain. What, who cares, why does the Supreme Court care about this what's the what's the reasoning for this and the reason is that we don't want to prevent other people from being able to use an abstract idea an abstract idea doesn't belong to anybody the specific practical application of that idea that you can claim that if you come up with a way of using that idea in a way that creates something useful and and new that's grounds for keeping other people from using it but you can't use the entire field, this entire idea, and prevent other people from using it. That would be unfair, and it, and it would undermine the idea of the intellectual property system. Okay? Now, it's a tough distinction. It's not easy to say what is abstract and what is practical. But, but that's why I have these examples that hopefully will make it clear. Right. For me, another thing to add is, I just want to ask you, are you how do you end up uh, in the software coding uh, Patent era. Sure, can sure. You, can you deliver it for our audience? Of course. How do you manage to, to find this? Good, uh, good question, Kobe. Reality? Good question, Kobe. And I find myself asking that sometimes myself and pounding my head against the table and dealing with complex things like this. But I guess my own personal background is um, I, I grew up as the son of a scientist technology and engineering, and I pursued it throughout high school and even in college. I got to the point in college when I was studying somewhat advanced chemistry and physics and math, that I got to the point where I realized I'm just not getting it anymore. I, I'm not cut out for doing this at a, at a very high level. find it interesting, but I just know my limits, and, and, uh, and I think I've reached it. So at that point, I shifted gears a little in pursuing law. And I shifted into that. In law school, I sort of found this really old that was just starting to explode in the, the early 2000s of intellectual property law. In the middle of the bubble. I think you yeah, exactly. It was right, right at the peak uh, before everything came crashing down. Because it gave me the way to, to sort of connect my own toward law and toward rhetoric and making arguments and, and speaking and writing and all that 
with the science and technology part of me that that I still found fascinating, but just realized that that wasn't something I could do professionally and, and do, you know, excel at. So, and that's sort of how I stumbled into it. Um, and and in this particular realm, I, I handle all sorts of technology, everything from biotech to, to software, to consumer electronics, to automotive, to really everything there is. Um, but in this case, this particular case seems to be much more about software and, and what are called business methods. Cool. All right. So, okay. So now we'll, uh, now we'll jump into to the Alice case and we'll see the implications of Alice meaning what happened since Alice uh, was decided. So within the patent office, within the PTO, there are different, different departments for different types of technology. So there are particular patent examiners. These are the people who look at the patent claims and decide whether they deserve a patent or not. There are particular ones who are chemistry, PhDs or masters, they are biology PhDs, and there are computer science PhDs and, and masters and, and just experts in these fields. And they're divided into these different units. They're called business, I'm, I'm sorry, they're called art units um, within the patent office. And each of these art units considers different technology. So someone did a study, a few people have done studies actually, of the particular art unit that deals with software and what's also called business method patents, which isn't quite software, but it, it's something like in the Alice case, a, a way of doing business, a creative new way of coming up with something. And they looked at the statistics of what was going on before the Alice case happened. And what they found was the rejection rate, meaning the percentage of times that the patent examiner said, you cannot get a patent on this. It more than tripled from 24% to 78% between January and June 2014. June was about almost a year ago, was right after the Alice case came out. Um, and, and at the same time, the acceptance rate, the percentage of times when the examiner said, we're gonna take this patent, it's, it's acceptable, it dropped from 24% to four and a half percent. Dramatic rates, this doesn't happen every, every day of the week. It's bounced back, it's softened a little bit since then, um, since June but it's still very significant. Uh, and then what about at the courts? Well, in between June and October of 2014, there were 12 cases found anyway that were decided that involved this issue of abstract ideas. And out of those 12, 11 times, the court held what the claims were not valid, that they weren't patent -held. Same thing within the Patent Trial and Appeals Board. This is a um, section of the Patent Office that handles appeals and handles certain other, other matters. 90% of the rulings on these grounds related to Alice held the claims to be invalid. So we're seeing across every level of the judicial and the administrative system, this Alice case is having a, a very significant impact. Um, all right, now uh, in, in um, December, the patent office issued these preliminary instructions and guidelines. And it try, what it tried to do is to take the Alice case, and we're on slide eight now, tried to take the Alice case and turn it into practical guidance for, for people applying for patents. And it did, I think, a, a reasonably good job of that. Um, and, and we're gonna see what these, what these, uh, what these were. So what it applied, now we're moving to slide 10 was a two-step analysis, all right? And it's really sort of a three-step because it's 2A and 2B. Um, the first step is, is the most simple, and this is, this is something that we, we won't even really spend much time on. Is the claim to a process, a machine, a manufacturer, or a composition of matter? Fundamentally, you need to be able to do one of these four things in order to get a patent. Again, it can't be something so abstract that you can't even do anything with it. Uh, it's got to be something real and concrete, okay? If you're not there, then forget it. You shouldn't even be applying for a patent. So that this is very, very basic stuff. But now, steps 2A and 2B, these are, are the really complicated ones, and this is what we're going to deal with. Is the claim directed to a law of nature, a natural phenomenon, or an abstract idea? These are the three big categories that, that matter. And like we saw before, this is the first real big step. Is there even an issue of this abstract idea in your patent, okay? 
If not, great. We're, we're all good. You get your patent. We don't have to deal with this Alice issue at all. Everything's fine. But if so, if there's even a, a hint or a, a whiff of this abstract idea, then we go to step 2B. And there, what we need to have is significantly more. That's the, that's the key issue. Okay. Um, so, so Michael, yes. Michael, can you give an example of an abstract idea? Just yes. Like if I have uh, some sort of a software, what would be an, an, an abstract idea? Right. So let me give um, let me give an example an example here. If we could, if we move ahead to slide number thirteen, these are these are some of the things that are identified in this in the guidelines as what are abstract ideas, laws of nature. So an abstract idea would be a fundamental economic or long-standing commercial practice, okay? Like we saw before, hedging risk through a third-party intermediary, right? That's something people have done forever, and it's, it's really, it's, it's an idea. It's not an implementation of that idea. It's a concept, right? You want to, to make sure that everyone has what they have. A method of organizing human activity, okay? an idea of itself, a mathematical relationship. One example, Pythagorean theorem, okay? For those of you who remember your, your uh, high school or even maybe junior high school, math, right triangle, if you take the square of one side plus the square, of the, it's equal to the square of the hypotenuse of the diagonal side of that triangle, right. okay? Very fundamental mathematical law, law of nature that was discovered uh, 2,500 years ago by Pythagoras in ancient Greece. Okay? Yeah. If, let's imagine Pythagoras lived today and he hadn't invent, he hadn't discovered that law and he came up with the Pythagorean theorem today. A patent on that idea. Okay? You can't get a patent on the Pythagorean theorem. Nature. It's a mathematical concept. Now, if you came up, if Pythagoras came up with a way of applying that idea in a certain way, that was significantly more than that, he could get a patent. So if he tried to file a patent claim, the method of calculating the length of a hypotenuse of a triangle based on the length of the two other sides of the triangle, that would be too abstract to get a patent. Okay, But if he came up with, let's say, a computer-aided design software suite that did all sorts of things. And one of the things it did was that it used the Pythagorean theorem to come up with a certain result. That is accepted. That would be OK. All right? Yeah. So and again, it, the, the reason that it's difficult to understand it, it is because it's difficult to understand. <laughs> um, so and in fact, this is a, on slide 12 here. The, um, the, the, what, the, what the patent office said is, this is difficult. Courts, in the second bullet, courts should tread carefully in scrutinizing such claims because at some level, all inventions embody, use, reflect, rest upon, or apply the law of nature, natural phenomenon, or abstract idea. Everything's based on something like that. An idea is an idea. It's something that pops in your head, and then you apply it and figure something out. But the key is in this first bullet point that you not preempt others from using this law entirely. All right, so let's take a look, um, in the interest of time, let's take a look at some of these, uh, at some of these examples of what this would be. Um, so, first of all, uh, one of the key cases was Ultramercial versus Hulu. Um, those of you out there, certainly in the United States, will recognize the name Hulu. It's a service that's similar to Netflix, um, in a way. It's a video streaming service that you pay a monthly subscription fee for. Um, but, and, but what it does, what's different from Netflix is that it shows you essentially right up to the minute network television shows from the United States. So you don't have to buy your cable subscription in the US or have an, one of these HD antennas. You can get all your shows streaming through, through the internet. Um, but in order to see these shows, even when you pay the subscription, you have to watch certain commercials. Okay? You're not allowed to get access to the content unless you watch certain advertisements before the concept, that, and, and even within the content. Um, so, fine, so that's Hulu. So a company called Ultramercial 
came up with an 11 step method for what they called internet distribution of copyrighted media in which advertisers pay for the media and users receive the content for free if they agree to view an advertisement, okay? They claimed that they came up with this before Hulu ever did it. And according to what I understand, they actually did. But the question is, is this something, this concept of allowing a viewer to access content, real content, only after they watch a paid advertisement, is that concept something that's concrete enough that you can get a patent on? Okay, and so step one, first of all, we're gonna see is there is an abstract idea involved here in general at all? And in fact, the court said, yes, there is. The process of receiving copyrighted media, selecting an ad, et cetera, et cetera, this is an abstract idea, okay? Um, and what was interesting is in the claim, in the patent claim, there were 11 steps to this. And Ultramercial, the patent holder, kept saying, hang on a second, this is not an abstract idea. We have all these detailed steps of how you get to it. How is that abstract? We're giving you very, very particular, uh, specific ideas of how you do this. And in general, in, patent, in the patent context, the longer your claim is, the more specific and narrow it is, because you keep adding words that are limiting your invention. If you have a one-line patent then claim, then, then it's very broad. But the more you add, the more narrow the invention is. So, so that's what they said, but the court said, no, that's really not, not true. It said, although other limitations add a degree of particularity, the concept embodied show, of showing an advertisement is just an abstract idea. And adding other elements that, you know, the elements would be sort of clicking on, the, you know, the step of clicking on this portion of the ad, watching the ad, closing the ad, opening up the content. These were all the different steps. All of these didn't, uh, didn't get it out of that. And then the question is, were any of these steps significantly more than this abstract idea? And the court found that they simply weren't because it wasn't enough to transform this abstract idea. Even though you have all these different steps, they're all pretty much very, very basic steps. Um, and therefore the court found that this patent was not valid. It was not patent eligible and Hulu got away from it. Because they just mentioned the process, right? It was, it was just a regular process. This is what they, you know, the, the, Exactly, and the pro even though there was some particularity in the process, it just wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to be significantly more than the very basic idea of watch an advertisement, get access to the content, okay? So, so that's that, and that's, that's sort of one to put on one side of the spectrum. We can hold that in our minds. Now let's look at one where the court found, uh, in fact, you could get a patent. And this was DDR holding in December of, of this last year, about five months ago. And if anyone who's ever used a website like hotels.com uh, or any of these aggregating travel websites or any aggregating site in general, what you do is you plug in your criteria for, let's say, where you want to stay in a hotel in, uh, in uh, Rome, and it gives you a whole list of, of different hotels. Now, hotels.com, they want you to stay on their web page and book a hotel through, uh, through them because they get a referral fee. They may also get a fee if you click through and then open up the specific hotel in another window, but they're gonna get a bigger fee if you book on their website itself. So they wanna make sure that users are staying on their page. Um, so what do they do? They know that other users may want, may feel more comfortable seeing the, the website of the hotel itself. So they incorporate into the hotels.com webpage what's called a composite web page. You're on hotels.com, but what you're seeing, the content you're seeing has the look and feel of the actual hotel that you're looking at. Therefore, it's the best of both worlds. The user's happy because he doesn't have to click on another site and he sees, he's comfortable, this is what the hotel looks like, the hotel webpage, I feel confident, I'm not gonna get scammed by this. And hotels.com keeps you on the page and you keep, um, and, and they get their referral fee. All right, so DDR Holdings claim to have come up with this idea of, of a composite webpage with the look and feel. And that's what, that's, what, that's what it was. 
So the court found, first of all, step one, is there an abstract idea? Um, yes, there is. It's the idea of keeping a user linked in somewhere to your page by creating a page that has the look and feel of another page. That is, it's abstract enough that, that we're gonna say, we need to look at this more carefully. Significantly more, and here the court said, yes, step two, this was significantly more. What they said is the claim solution really rooted in computer technology in order to overcome a problem specifically arising in the realm of computer networks, okay? The claims unique to the internet. And what was the challenge? That a customer's attention could be transported away from one provider to another by clicking a link without any need to return. And this was a specific problem that DDR Holdings, the patent holder, came up with before. And they, they distinguished the ultra-mercial case. They distinguished the case of Hulu. Why? They said here, specify how the interactions with the internet are manipulated the conventional sequence of events are used. Most importantly, perhaps, the claims did not preempt every application of the idea of making two web. It didn't say we're, we're claiming the entire concept of making a composite web page. It had a specific application, specific algorithm, uh, and a way of doing that. So that's that's the basic difference. Um, I'll just run quickly over some of these other ones. Smart Flash versus Apple. This is a case that was decided in January. You, Some of you who follow um, this these issues may recognize the name of this case, um, not because of what I'm about to describe, but because a few months later, a jury held Apple liable on this patent and, and ordered Apple to pay Smart Flash half a billion dollars for this patent. So that actually made the headlines. But what happened before that didn't make the headlines because it's what we call very patent geeky, and which is what our what we're talking about today. But before they could get to a jury trial, Apple get the case thrown out of court. They said, Smart Flash, your invention here is not an invention. It's not eligible under, uh, under Alice. And here the idea uh, was the following. For any of you who use the Apple Store, the App Store or iTunes, or even Google Play or any of the other parallel types of stores, you know that there's sometimes an issue where you go to buy an app or a song or a video that you've already purchased. And you certainly don't want to pay twice for that app, for that content. So luckily, the store has developed a way where it knows, it recognizes that you bought it already, and it sends you sort of a warning saying you've already purchased this, you don't need to pay for it again, but you can download it again, okay? That's what Smart Flash claimed to have come up with, that concept of checking your existing content against what it is that you want to buy from the store and making sure that there's no overlap, et cetera. And as you can imagine, this was the same sort of issue. Isn't that a sort of very basic concept? And it is. There is an abstract idea in there. But the way that Smart Flash claimed it was significantly more. That's what the court found. Um, there were specific ways of using these memories and data types and rules. And the way that they laid it out was much more specific, much more, um, much more particular. And therefore, Apple couldn't get off the hook. I, I have a question. Yes. Does any, I know you, though you must, must uh, know the meaning of trolls in the industry of uh, patents. Um, uh, of trolls, course. yes, yeah. of course. So also trolls in the software? There are, there are. And uh, a troll is a, is a, a challenging word for, for many different reasons. Very controversial. Um, it's difficult to define. So I prefer to use the term, there, there are some very generic euphemisms that we have, like patent assertion entities, or we also call them non-practicing entities. Um, if you want to give it a little bit more of a, of a negative spin, uh, we refer to people who abuse the patent system, companies or people who abuse the patent system. It, it, sometimes the line is difficult to draw. What is it? If someone had an invention, they had an idea, but they were never able to commercialize it, right? Are they a troll for trying to stop others from using it? Maybe, maybe not, right? 
if they're purely using the threat of litigation in order to extract settlements for an invention that isn't a real invention, I would say that that's, that's abusive behavior. But, but it's, it's difficult to define that sometimes. I think it's, it's fair to the cases, but many of the ones that we've seen, they do involve companies that are not actually making anything you can call them a troll if you like, but they they might so dispute that. We see that. a shifting in a, a more people uh, on more trolls, like uh, trying to bias to, towards software uh, patents uh, instead of the other uh, other industry. Okay. So I think I think are the the primary area where there is issues of of abuse in the patent system, and you have these non practicing entities filing suits. Not as much in medical device or in biotech because it takes a lot of R&D, a lot of money and a lot of time to develop, let's say, a medical device or a, or a chem chemical formulation for treatment of a, of a disease. You can't just come up with that on your own, but you can come up with on your own the idea of mitigating settlement risk, uh, right? It's much easier to overrun the patent. Exactly. We own uh, this idea, let's, let's negotiate. Exactly, exactly. So that you, you do see it a lot field, no question in fact everything that we're looking at today are our yeah. software cases so um, okay so that was smart flash so there are other cases as well um, I would encourage you here on slide 23 we have some other resources for some other cases that you can look at um, some of them are on the the patent off of them or elsewhere uh, but there's obviously a lot more to say and I'm just giving you a little bit of a flavor for what what is and what is an abstract what is and isn't particular enough. So let's turn to how do you deal with this? And hopefully you'll find this the most interesting. Again, it's difficult to give guide to companies on a specific level because everyone has their own challenges. But here are some of the things that we think about at a high level at our firm and we advise our clients about how do we deal with, with this issue, with this new case that's creating all this turbulence in the field and creating a lot of uncertainty. How do we try to get some, some certainty here? So we'll talk about a few strategies for, for how to handle this. If we turn to slide 25, um, we call this the delay, delay, delay tactic, right? Sometimes uh, you, 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 you need to delay in order to get the result that you want. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, this is still, still, even a year out, it's still so new, there's still, so many repercussions and ripples that are coming out of this case that no one really knows yet where it's going to go. We have a few test cases like we saw verify what the Supreme Court meant by this. It's going to take time for that to happen. It always does in any area of the law. That's always how it is. So, so there's uncertainty now. There will be less uncertainty as time wears on. So if you can afford, as a general matter, to delay in terms of interest, that will help you reduce your uncertainty. So what do I mean? What are some examples? So when, if you're in the middle of filing patent applications right now, try to seek extensions. Try to seek what's called an RCE, a request for continuing things you have to reply to things. Try to appeal your cases. If you have a rejection based on Alice, appeal, drag it out, stretch it out. Hopefully at some point soon, this issue is going to sort itself out more and more. Um, so in general, try to get your feet wet and feel what this is like. If you can afford to, meaning if you have a little bit of time and maybe a little bit of money and you have a test case, let's say an application, that you don't really care that much about. Maybe somewhat valuable or tangentially valuable your business. Try it out. Put it before the patent office. See what happens. Engage with the patent with the patent examiner and see what happens. The cost, the, the downside is not all that much about it. But in the meantime, you'll have a chance to, to see what the process is. The other, the other strategy we, we often advise, and this sometimes there are cost issues with this, but we, we find that generally trying to get an interview with the examiner, with the patent examiner, is a good way uh, to discuss your situation without making c committing to certain things in writing. You can have a verbal conversation with the examiner. 
these exam these these uh, interviews get summarized in writing by the examiner and and often by the applicant. But, but that can never fully convey all the details of everything that, that you that you discuss. So, so that's sort of one strategy. Of course, the, the truth is it may never become fully crystal clear what's going on here. So how do we go back through the not preemptive? or abstract idea. Don't try to be Pythagoras claiming the entire Pythagorean theorem. That's not going to end well for you. Instead, you need to demonstrate that your claims are limited to specific applications of this abstract idea. Make that clear throughout your patent application claims that that's what you're doing. Okay. And what do I mean by that? Well, you need as much physical structure as you can. Don't just talk about pie in the sky idea ideas, try to refer to physical things. In other words, a point of sale device, for instance, seller. Don't talk, use the word seller. Use a point of sale device. Use the terms like digital media file, not an advertisement. Use something that's much more concrete that, that someone being in a concrete form. Try to do that as much as possible. Another strategy, try to tailor your claim language to the language of other claims that were already found to be acceptable, right? Take a look at that, um, at the DDR case and the Smart Flash case. Take a look at their claims, study those claims. Your idea may be in a different the strategies that have worked for other, for other companies and try to do that. Um, and then the other strategy in this, this claims, Again, is deep use your patent, which is a short amount of time, lays out a whole bunch of things, right? But you right, imagine use your dependent claim chair wherein the chair also has arm rests, okay? And then the chair of claim two or the chair of claim one wherein the chair also has a spinning mechanism. So the way you build your claim set is you start with the most basic, pieces by pieces by pieces to make it, to make it that way. You add, more, add more features. You add more features, exactly. And those are called dependent claims. The dependent claims are narrower than the independent claims, but um, it, it's an important strategy in draft. So when doing that, how would you, how would you do that to, to avoid these Alice problems? So, um, so what you want to do is to add detail to these dependent claims that will allow them to survive if the first one doesn't, right? So imagine if Ultramercial, instead of having this 11 second claim, claim two, saying the process of claim one also including and and increase the content. So there, if the core, or even a claim two, if you incorporate claim two into claim one, then we'll give you the patent, right? So you want to do things like that, ability, because you might get all of claim one, so you don't want to do it all right away. You might get the broader claim, but if you don't, then you'll at least have these dependent ones you can, you can put into that, yeah. okay? Yeah. All right, um, and then what about drawing your patent just again, by way of patent, consists of two things, a description of your and the claims that claim the idea. And the claims are the most important part. That's what actually is your invention. But the description has to support the claims. In other words, you have to be able to, if you can't understand the claims based on what's described, then the claims may not be granted. It has to be supported by the rest of the description. That description is called the specification. And it includes both words, the written words, how you use to describe it, and the pictures that you use. So you need to draw, you need to write the specification in order to match what's happening in, in the claims. And what, how do you do that? You need to give some example problems. Problems like we saw, for example, with the hotels.com that you don't want to get shifted away 
from that web page. You have to state why that's the problem, and then you have to explain why your particular idea is a solution to that problem. Um, and you want to also make sure that you're not preempting this abstract idea. So one thing you might try doing is say, we are not claiming this, right? It's a little weird. It's not something that patent lawyers generally advise clients to do, but in the wake of this decision, we're starting to see more and more tell the examiner, we are not so abstract that we would also cover this. We just, now, of course, make sure that you really don't want to cover that if it's something that could be valuing your business. You're giving that away. So, so specific, we got you really don't want to that can help is the interview and prosecution. As you're going through the prosecution, when you're going through the process of back and forth with the patent examiner, hearing their objections, responding to their objections, sometimes amending your claims, changing them, you want to use these names. You always want to be explaining very explicitly how what you're doing is significantly more than just an abstract idea. Um, and just take examples, look through the, the what's called the file history, the, um, the, the record of the back and forth between the applicant and the examiner. That's all recorded. It's all some exceptions. Take a look at cases that are similar to yours and see what these applicants have done in those cases, what worked and what didn't work, and, and use that language. We obviously deal with this a lot. Um, and, and we have sort of form language that, that you can use for that. So with that, I think I'll and uh, the last slide, you have my contact information if you'd like to, to learn anything more. Um, if you gentlemen have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I think we have everything recorded. I can thank you very much much for your work if you have more questions please don't hesitate right the rest of the thing you know visit that's the best alia you know we, we shall see. If you will it, it is no dream. <laughs> amen. Amen to that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity, and um, hopefully we'll get to do it again. Yeah.